called one another. Learning how to one another well, how to be a part of a community well, how God intends us to live together well. Uh, and it's, I know personally, it's been a really exciting, a really practical and a really great series. I have gotten so much out of this series, so um, I hope you have as well. And we're going to be continuing that today. And the topic or the thing that I'm going to be talking about is God's call for us to forgive one another. But before we talk about that, I want to tell you a little bit about some movies that I used to like as a child. Um, I, like most children, loved Disney movies. Put your hands up if you like Disney movies still. Yeah, yes, I really, really like Disney movies. I must say, I think Moana has been my new favourite. I haven't seen the most recent new ones. Some of you might have, but I loved Moana. But when I was a child, people used to ask me all the time, what's your favourite movie, you know, what, what movie do you like? And, and I, I thought that was a bit of a funny question, personally, because for me, I couldn't just pick one favourite movie. I never had an all-time favourite movie because it changed depending on how old I was, what I was into at the time, uh, yeah, what other movies were out, how I was feeling, my mood sometimes depended on the movie. So when people would ask me, what's your favourite movie? I just kind of had to pick a go-to movie, a movie that I thought was a pretty good all-rounder, something I could enjoy when I was feeling any way that I could feel. Um, and that movie for me was The Lion King. I loved The Lion King. There was something about it, something about Simba as, as a young lion, if you don't know what the movie is, um, it's about a family of lions who, they rule Pride Rock. And Simba is, is the baby of Mufasa, and I actually don't know the mum's name, um, but he is he's the heir of Pride Rock. He is going to grow up and become the king, just like Mufasa is at the time. So, Mufasa, though, is a, is a very gentle, a very loving, a very kind king. And his, his son, he lets him um, grow and lets him explore. And I love Simba's excitement. I know that, that song, my favourite song, is that, I just can't wait to be king. That one's my favourite. Um, and it's so joyful. And he just has such, a, such an excitement. But there is an evil uncle very original. Evil uncle. His name is Scar because he has a big scar down. Well, actually, I don't know why his name is Scar, but he has a big scar down his face. I assume that's why his name is Scar. And evil uncle Scar is jealous of Simba and jealous of Mufasa because he wants to be king. He wants to rule Pride Rock. And so he, he plots against Mufasa and against Simba and he tries to kill them. He sends a stampede of wildebeests through a, through a valley and unfortunately, Mufasa does not make it. He then kills Mufasa in that and in the time, he tries to kill Simba as well. And to this day, I have a slight irrational fear of being caught in a stampede of, of wildebeests. I don't think it will ever happen, but that, that used to frighten me. What if I get caught in a stampede one day? But Simba escapes. Mufasa, Mufasa's dead, Simba escapes. And Uncle Scar takes on Pride Rock. Simba spends years and years and away from Pride Rock and, and it goes downhill. It doesn't go very well. Then Simba one day realises, I need to go back. I need to take over the land again. I need to claim my rightful place as king and, and destroy Scar for what he's done. So he goes back and there's a big epic battle, isn't there, with, with Timon and Pumbaa as well, um, his little sidekicks, and, and they go and they defeat Scar. The big battle and it's, it's epic, it's awesome. And then we all celebrate because... Simba's got his rightful place as king. Simba got justice. Simba got vengeance against Scar. Yeah, like that's the way the movie's meant to end. And this is the way a lot of movies end, I think. A lot of movies have a similar plot to this where there's a good guy and a bad guy and the bad guy gets jealous or something and, and tries to destroy the good guy, but then the good guy 
comes back and gets his justice against the bad guy. And this is a really common plot for movies. Because can you imagine if it went the other way? Imagine if Simba one day realises, oh, maybe I've been a bit hard on Scar. And he makes his way back to Pride Rock with a white flag of surrender, and he sits down with him and he goes, Scar, I forgive you. I think I would like to come back to Pride Rock and maybe together we can, we can rule Pride Rock as a team for the good of all the other animals that are a part of it. Imagine if that was the ending of the movie. I'd be frustrated. I'd be like, oh, that's not the way it's meant to end. There's no, where's the justice in that? Where's the, the celebration in that? I would be greatly disappointed. I would be greatly frustrated because it's not fair. That's not how it's meant to end. And why do we have this feeling? Because I think a lot, a lot of you can think of movies that are similar. And if your favourite movie ended that way, why, why do we feel this way? It's because we crave justice. We crave this vengeance. We want to see the bad guy taken down. We want to celebrate when they get what they deserve. And that's why most movies that are out are based and built on this plot. But this actually reveals to us something, something greater and deeper within us. Our natural response is not forgiveness. Our natural response is not forgiveness. And that's because forgiveness, it doesn't satisfy that craving in our hearts. Forgiveness takes a lot more effort, a lot more energy. It's easier to live holding a grudge against someone than it is to forgive them. And as humans, we desire this, this immediate or at least imminent justice. And for us, withholding forgiveness gives us the sense that we are delivering justice in, that, in some way. We desire to give people what they deserve. We live in a society of an eye for an eye. We, we want people to be aware of the depth of how they have hurt us. We want them to experience what we've experienced. We, we struggle with pride because we think if we forgive, it, it shows maybe a little bit of weakness in us. Ultimately, we believe that people who have wronged us a lot of the time our initial response is not forgiveness. And this is the reality of our human nature. Every single one of us, at some point in time, has felt this to some degree. Forgiveness is not our natural response. So it's a wonder why so many of us, myself included, hear this word forgiveness we read about forgiveness, we talk about forgiveness, but we react with such complacency. Why do we react with complacency when it comes to forgiveness, when this is totally the opposite of how we naturally respond? As I've been preparing for this message uh, on forgiveness, I've had a lot of people say to me, oh, Ash, Forgiveness, that's a great message to speak on. That's a great thing to speak on. And they're not wrong. I, I agree. I think it is really good to speak on. But this topic of forgiveness, particularly when it's a call for us to forgive other people, it, it's, this is really difficult for us to grasp. I think it's one of the hardest things to talk about because of our complacency. Complacency is dangerous. Forgiveness is so unnatural to us that rather than being intentional with it, we've attempted to ignore it through complacency. And this comes off usually in one of two ways. First, we think we've grasped it. We think, oh yeah, forgiveness. Yep, I know that one. I'm good. And we re respond with complacency in that way. The other way we respond is we think 
that either because the other person doesn't deserve it or we've been hurt too deeply, that we couldn't possibly offer what is needed to forgive. And for those of us often who fall into this category when it comes to forgiveness, it's come from a deep place of hurt. And, and for those of you who might feel that you're in this category, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because that is hard and that hurts. And, and often for those of us, when we fall into this category, as soon as we hear forgiveness, we hear the word forgiveness, we just want to retreat. That's too, that's too hard. I don't even want to think about it. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to ignore it. And that's, that's another sense of complacency. And most of us, to some degree, would fit into one of these categories, sometimes even both. They are both different forms of complacency. And complacency is dangerous because when we become complacent, we become comfortable. And then we don't even, even realize or recognize the issues that are arising. And that's exactly where the enemy wants us. Half the battle with forgiveness is realizing that this is actually foundational to our faith, foundational to our community, and realizing then that it is something that we do struggle with and that we have to intentionally work on. We have forgotten the weight of forgiveness. It's become dry to us. So what does the Bible have to say? Well, we're going to be reading today from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. So I encourage you to get your Bibles out if you haven't already and read along with me. So it's Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that you have given us forgiveness. And Lord, we just pray right now that um, you would be combating with us this complacency with forgiveness, Lord, that, that as we speak about it this morning, you would be softening and opening our hearts to your forgiveness and the forgiveness of others. Lord, I pray as we, as we get into your word and as we read your word more and know you more, that we would just be filled with joy of who you are. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So, a little bit of context about what we've just re um, read. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae, because the people of the church, they were falling into serious error. As we know, when we, when we read a passage and we see the first word is therefore, we need to know what it's there for. So, when we look back, like when it says therefore, when we look back at what's come just before the passage, it's clear that the people in the, the Colossians, they were struggling with how to live their life as people who have been made new through Jesus. They were living as though they had not been saved. But Paul reminds them that they have been raised with Christ. They have put off their old self and their new self, which they have put on, should be continually renewed through knowing Jesus more and more. So the Colossians, they were obviously struggling with how to one another well. They were brothers and sisters in Christ and Paul is reminding them of that. And we see these virtues here in, in verse 12 that the Colossians should be known for. Their compassion, their kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. These are all evidence of being made new in Christ through the fruits of the Spirit. And 
I love this picture of being clothed by these things because that means that the Colossians and us, we should be recognised by these things. When you see a policeman in the street, you recognise him by what he wears and the same goes with us. We should be clothed and recognised by others through these virtues and through the fruits of the Spirit that we wear. And we see in verse 14 that over all of these virtues, we need to put on love, which binds them together in perfect harmony. And Dave Luthie, our lead pastor, he spoke on this because love is the foundation and what ties together everything. Uh, So if you've missed that message, you'd like to go back and watch it, please do that. Um, That'd be great. But what we're going to be focusing on today is verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And we know this is an important command, an important call, because it's repeated twice. Forgive one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. When we see things like that, we know this is important. And we also know that this is, this is talked about through the entirety of the Bible. But as we've spoken about, this is easier said than done. Due to our our complacency, we we struggle to understand what it means to forgive. But Jesus teaches very clearly on this through Matthew 18. And we're going to read this passage as well in a minute. And through this passage, we see two types of complacency played out by two different people. First is Peter. And Peter's got a false sense of understanding and grasping forgiveness. We see he comes to Jesus boasting about how many times he's willing to forgive. And Jesus rebukes him in that. Like, no, there should not be a number. And the other character is a servant who who withholds forgiveness from someone else. And that's his form of complacency. So we're going to read that now as well. It's Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked... Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And Jesus said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off. He had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. They went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So this servant owed his master 10,000 bags of gold. This day and age, that translates to approximately 160,000 years worth of wages. 160,000 years worth of wages. That is lifetimes of debt that he owes. His debt equates to something around $3.8 billion. This is an amount that... I I cannot even fathom being in debt that much to someone else. There would have been no way humanly possible for this servant to pay back what he owed his master. And yet, his master had mercy on him. He cancelled that debt totally, not because he deserved it, not because of anything 
special that he said or had done. But the servant, the servant then went out after having this kind of debt cancelled and found someone who owed him 100 silver coins. That's about 100 days wages, about three months worth of payment. And yet, this, this servant could not forgive the debt. He beat him. And when he couldn't pay, he threw him in jail, where he had no possible way of earning those wages anyway. This, to me, is, is insane. 160,000 years worth of debt versus 100 days worth of debt. How could the servant then just go out and treat his fellow servant this way? You see, the point and, and what Jesus says in this parable is, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? He should have been able to forgive because of how much he had been forgiven. And when we read this parable, we, we often have a tendency to really focus on the servant, and that's good, but I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on the master. What kind of master is willing to forgive nearly $4 billion worth of debt? What kind of master who went out with the intention of settling his accounts then just forgives that kind of money? What kind of master lets that amount of debt go unpaid? What kind of master cancels a debt with no strings attached and expecting nothing in return? This is a great a merciful, a kind, a compassionate, patient, humble, gentle master. All those virtues we see in that passage. This is a master that I would not ever expect to meet here on earth. But the good news is that we actually all have a master like this and we have access to him. God is the merciful master. God is gracious and kind. He is compassionate and gentle. God is like the master who cancelled the debts. But with God, not only did he, did he cancel these debts himself, he actually paid for them. He came, he cancelled them, he paid for them. And, and that payment is actually full liberation. Because a payment of the debt means that there is no way ever in the future that someone could come to him and say, you still owe me this much because it was never paid for. This is a future full payment of those debts, 160,000 years worth of wages. So much debt paid for. And God has done this for us, lifetimes worth, worth of debt. He's come, he's cancelled, and not only has he cancelled, he's paid for them. And it cost him his life. And the debt that he sacrificed himself for, it was ours. It was an eternal debt caused by our rebellion against God. A debt so great that we could never even dream of repaying it. But the good news is that we don't have to. Though Je through Jesus, our debt has been paid for. And this is good news. This is, this is joy. The joy that I would feel if someone paid off my mortgage would be exponential. I would remember it for the rest of my life. And, and from that, I hope that I would then be generous towards others because of the generosity someone showed to me. But this joy that you would feel or that I would feel if someone paid our mortgage for us is marginal. It is nothing compared to the joy that we should feel, the liberation, the freedom that we should feel having our debts, our eternal debts paid for by Jesus. This is the forgiveness that Jesus has offered us. Liberation release, dismissal for our lives, no matter who we are or what we've done. Because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. He was able to cover the sin of anyone and restore relationship between us and God through his life and death on the cross. Jesus has done everything necessary to offer us forgiveness. 
He's always got a heart that is ready to forgive and all we have to do is come before him and ask. But we, we are like the servant. After having an unfathomable amount of debt paid and cancelled, we forget about it almost instantly. We don't celebrate. We don't we forget the joy of our salvation. We forget God's goodness to us. We receive the greatest gift of generosity and grace available to us and we so quickly will go out and we will accuse other people of what they've done to us, demanding that they repay in some way what they owe us or what we think they owe us. And this debt that other people have to us is insignificant compared to the debt that we have had paid for by Jesus. We so so quickly and so easily fall into pride and arrogance when it comes to forgiveness. We've lost the joy of salvation. And this is so often our attitude when we come to forgiveness. We've been lavished with grace and yet we feel we have the right to withhold it from other people. We've forgotten our own forgiveness. We've lost the joy and the thankfulness that comes from being forgiven by Jesus. So how do we combat this? Well, the passage in Colossians says, forgive one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. This is what our forgiveness of one another is anchored on. The reality is on our own, when it comes to our own strength, our own desire, We cannot forgive. If we keep trying to forgive on our own strength, it's like comparing brokenness to brokenness. Because on our own strength, we say, well, I can't forgive that person. I don't think that person deserves it. They're not good enough. I this, they that. And it's just comparison between between us who are broken and them who are broken. We need to stop because this is not the point. Our forgiveness is not based on us. It's not based on others. It is based on God. Forgive just as the Lord forgave you. We forgive not because of the other person, not because of ourselves, but because of God. Because he first forgave us. Understanding our own forgiveness is the only way that we can ever offer true forgiveness to others. Our attitude on forgiveness, it doesn't rely on us, on how we feel. It doesn't rely on the other person, whether we think they deserve it or not. But forgiveness is an extension of what we have already been given. God is calling us to have an attitude of readiness to forgive one another at all times. And we can do that when we realize that this is a direct outflowing and response from what God has done for us first. We have a heavenly father who doesn't call us to anything that he hasn't first done himself. What a loving and gracious father he is. Jesus suffered for you. He understands the suffering that comes with forgiveness He died for you. He understands that sometimes to forgive other people, we need to die to ourselves. We need to put ourselves second. He knows that. He bore our sin. He knows what it is to be with brothers and sisters and bear with one another. He knows what that is. He loves you. And he forgave you. He knows the pain, the suffering, the struggle that sometimes is associated with forgiveness. And yet he delights in forgiving. He delights in forgiving you, in in releasing you, in dismissing your debt. And it's through knowing the weight of this that we are then able to offer forgiveness to other people. We can forgive and we are called to forgive because we have been forgiven. And the powerful thing about forgiveness, the powerful thing about it is what it does to a community of believers. 
A community of believers who are known for their forgiveness of one another is a community that will experience peace, a community that will experience unity and fruitfulness as they gather. As the body of Christ, when we have peace and unity and harmony, which comes through forgiveness, we can also expect to see much fruitfulness in our gathering. It talks in the passage in verse 16 uh, that the message of Christ will dwell richly among us. There will be constant discipleship as we uh, seek to teach and admonish one another. And above all, everything that we do, when we know that we are to be thankful, when we know that we forgive as the Lord forgave you, everything we do will be done from a deep sense of joy of our salvation, joy of the Lord. It will be done in the name of Jesus. And that is powerful. That is the kind of community that I want to be a part of. And that is what God is calling us to as well. So the question is, who do you need to forgive? People will hurt you. There are people in this room right now who I'm sure will hurt you one day. It's the reality of being brothers and sisters and a family in Christ. But what attitude will you have with them? Will you allow unforgiveness to come and shatter unity in this place? Or will you remember the forgiveness that you have been given and shown from Jesus and offer that to others? We are called to have an attitude and readiness to forgive just as God forgave us. So just as the team come back up now, I want you to spend a moment just thinking about who it is that you might still hold some some kind of resentment or bitterness towards. I think we all have people in our lives that, that we need to extend forgiveness to. And this is important. But rather than just focusing on that person and just dwelling on that person, I actually want you to Think more about what God has done for you, about your relationship with Jesus, his forgiveness of you. So as the team, as the team play, as they think, as they sing, I want you to, to respond and, and come before Jesus, remembering your own forgiveness. Whatever that looks like for you, whether that's that's on your knees in surrender. Jesus, thank you. There's nothing I could do to own, uh, earn this, and you have given this to me whether it's standing up with your arms held high, Jesus, thank you, you are so great. Whatever it is, just spend time thinking and meditating on your own forgiveness. And then, and only then, start thinking about that other person and allow the forgiveness of Jesus to flow through you and and, and out from you to forgive them. Ask God what that might look like for you because that's between you and God. So I'm going to pray, and then I invite you to respond however that looks to you. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the great forgiver. God, our debt to you was unfathomable. It could not ever be repaid. And yet you came, and not only did you cancel it, but you paid for it yourself. And when we come before you, Lord, we can receive that forgiveness. We thank you for that. And Lord, you don't don't see us as that anymore because you have paid for it, but you see us as sons and daughters of you. You love us. You delight in us. And Lord, I pray that as we we meditate on that, Lord, that those people in our lives that we need to offer forgiveness to, that we've maybe become complacent about, Lord, would you put them on our hearts and would you... Give us the strength to forgive them. God, we can only do this because of what you've done for us. So Lord, allow us to forgive because of what you've done. We pray these things in your name. Amen.